Hello, everyone, and welcome to our international panel discussion, How Cybersecurity Issues Impact Domestic and International Businesses. Thank you for joining us. I know that as we do the little intro, some of you might be coming in, so I'll be a little bit uh, generous in my time to, uh, to welcome everyone in. But um, calling from Australia, so on behalf of the Australian listeners and the Australian speakers, I'd first like to do a welcome to country uh, or acknowledgement of country. In fact, um, in Australia, this is something we do before we open a public event to acknowledge uh, the uh, traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia. So in the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are attending today. I'd like to also thank LexisNexis Australia and UK, um, CAMS, uh, also for supporting this event and for being able to provide such a fabulous panel of speakers for you. Um, I'd like to also just address some housekeeping items. So for participants, what we'd like to see are the questions coming up through the chat box as you think of them. So you don't have to wait till the end. Uh, the session is being recorded, but as we go along, we've, we've allowed some time at the end um, to address some questions, but we're anticipating that a lot of the discussion will be quite robust as we go through. And so if your question happens to fit the discussion that's on at the time, I will um, you know, voice that question for you. And then if we have time at the end, we'll get to some questions. If not, all of the questions that you've popped in chat, we will use to format uh, perhaps a second session on this continually evolving topic in 2022 if we need be. So what are we gonna be talking about today? We're gonna to be talking about where cyber risk fits in your management system and who needs to care about this risk being managed. Obviously from our point of view, from the GRC Institute, we're talking about compliance professionals being involved in this, but who else needs to know? Your board may have responsibilities, your regulator probably cares, and you have some responsibility to your stakeholders to be thinking about these risks. Where, what are these current risks and what are their impacts? And what can you do to actually mitigate against these risks? Because there are some serious professionals out there who are targeting organisations and creating these risks for your organisation. So, so what can you do and what is best practice? So it's an interactive webinar. We will be, um, or you have been asked to fill out a questionnaire using your mobile phone via the QR code that you were supplied. Um, and we will be having a little look at the results that came from you as participants, as well as what our speakers have to say on those topics. So for those of you who haven't met me before, I am Naomi Burley. I'm the CEO of the GRC Institute. We're based in Sydney, Australia. Um, and we represent those working in the compliance profession in Australia and New Zealand and support their professional development and practice. I'm joined today by Jonathan Armstrong, uh, who is a partner at Cordery Compliance. Jonathan's an experienced lawyer with a concentration on technology and compliance, and his practice includes advising multinational companies on matters involving risk, compliance and technology across Europe. He's handled legal matters in more than 60 countries involving emerging technology, corporate governance, ethics, code implementation, reputation, internal investigations, marketing, branding, and global pri privacy policy, and is one of three co-authors of the LexisNexis definitive work on technology law, managing risk, technology, and communications, and we'd like to sell a few copies of that, so a little plug <laughs> for the book, as well as being a frequent broadcaster for the BBC and other channels. Dudley Neller is a partner at Gaydens. He's calling in tonight from Australia. And Dudley is a highly experienced lawyer with international and domestic experience advising on commercial, regulatory and technology matters with specialisations in financial technology, cyber risk, privacy and strategic sourcing and supply projects, um, because supply is definitely something that's being targeted by cyber risk. And he's been practising across Australia, Europe, the UK, the Philippines, India and South America for over 20 years. Ben Simons is also joining us today from the UK. Ben, you have spent some time in, the, in Australia as well. He's a barrister with the 36 Group and uh, he specialises in data protection and privacy law. Ben also advises on and undertakes litigation in relation to all aspects of data protection and privacy law that arise from cybersecurity incidents and data breaches and advises on litigation strategy in relation to defending shareholder class actions relating to data breaches. So the other side of the fence, Ben, 
Um, and he's published numerous articles in relation to data production and organisations' obligations to comply with the GDPR, which is topmost on your mind, even when you're ringing from Australia. Charmaine Tan joined, is the CGO from Privasec, which is now called Securo, and is one of the most established women in the fields of technology and cybersecurity. Charmaine is the Chief Growth Officer at Priv Privasec, now Securo, leading the security outreach strategy with C-suite um, level executives. She's also the author of Cyber Risk Leaders, Global C-suite Insights, Leadership and Influence in the Cyber Age, and she's been recognised in many areas for her specialised knowledge and speaking and communication on complex topics topics, especially in the area of security networks. She's the founder of Cyber Risk Meter, an international community and platform for cyber risk executives to exchange learnings. And she holds a bachelor's degree with honours in computer engineering from Nanyang Technolog Technological University in Singapore. So welcome all of these fabulous speakers. Um, so just to frame up the session at the beginning, what I'd like to uh, uh, our audience to really appreciate is how global this issue is and how common those issues are. So, so it isn't a different issue in Australia or the UK. And you can see from the caliber of the speakers that we have with us and their experience across so many regions that we have a truly international panel for you. Um, now, normally in different regions, we may be talking about compliance and be quite insular and refer to what our particular regulator is looking at. But with cyber, we can't have those conversations. It's a great leveller. Um, so even though we are many, many miles apart and 11 hours apart, uh, we're sharing the same concerns about risk, the same concerns about protecting our stakeholders and our organisations. I'd like to also um, thank... Uh, our partnering organisations with LexisNexis um, and CAMS and the GRCI, with the three partners coming together with the content from LexisNexis and the technology from CAMS and the education platform to, from GRCI, we're providing distinctly different resources but partnering together to assist you as professionals with this challenge. And we're all united to ensure you can do your absolute best. So thank you to our, our fellow partners in, for tonight. So let's move first to hear from the audience. What did you think the top three risk, uh, tips were for mitigating cyber risk? Um, let's have a little look at your results and see, and then we'll go to the panel and see what they think. I think all of those really cover some of the territory. And, and I think that, you know, this indicates this is why people are at this session. Input control and assess the effectiveness. Yeah, it's really hard to test though, isn't it? Because you don't know what they're going to come up with next. But I think that that's, that's why everyone's here today because this is not your average organisation's area of expertise. And this is where they've got to, you really do need help. The, the, one, the one that jumps out at me, Naomi, if I can just jump in as we're waiting for them to continue loading, was was train your staff. And yeah. the nature of this risk, and I'm, Jonathan's nodding his head as well, is that a lot of the cyber attacks are coming in at the coalface, so where your staff are receiving emails and, you know, having policies and procedures to help staff understand what to look out for, running fishing expeditions on a regular basis, mm. all, all that stuff type i guess you call it good good housekeeping um really does mitigate risk because a lot of these attacks are coming in by the by the front door through your through your staff emails yeah yeah, yeah that was absolutely. um i'll show you my homework that, that was definitely number one on my list as well <laughs> i yeah. phrased it in the good old tony blair days of education 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 it's it's yeah. definitely the way in which you mitigate most of the attacks and I think it's beyond telling people to solve problems. It's telling people to say something is unusual. You know, on the rails in, in the UK in the railways, we've got this campaign at the moment to say, you know, if you see something unusual, tell somebody about it. Mm -hmm. And that's the, yeah. that's the ethos we have to get in our organisations. Yeah. yeah, it's almost just that red flag going up and not necessarily knowing why it the, the email looks a bit unusual or dodgy, but yeah. but at least sort of asking the question and saying, I'm not going to do anything until I've passed it through to my service desk to have them take a look at it. And um, and that's that's all we're really wanting um, staff to be able to do. We don't need them to solve the, the issue or the problem. We just need to spot that something's not quite right here and, um, 
uh, and then enlisting some help internally and, and then obviously the organisation can get that help externally if it needs to. But um, I think that would be my number one tip along with a couple of others. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. So, so on that, you know, in that theme, I guess we go to why should compliance professionals care about, um, about cyber and how to mitigate those risks. And I'm going to throw to Jonathan and Ben on this, and Jonathan first, if you don't mind, um, mm. because I know you've got some thoughts on this one. So who needs to care about this and why should compliance care? Well, I think compliance has to care because management expects compliance to understand these issues. Uh, I've had uh, a, an incident where um, the uh, head of compliance, head of legal, was dismissed uh, as news broke of the issue, and the COO, uh, the, the CEO, said to him, "Look, um, uh, whenever I appear on CNN, and I didn't invite them into the building, somebody gets sacked. You were telling me you were feeling unwell. Do you want to resign on ill health?" And so that's not a conversation I think that any of us want to have. And it seems to me the pressure's coming maybe from five different directions. Firstly, fines are up. If I look at the uh, LexisNexis figures this morning for GDPR, it tells me that there are 1.3 billion euros of uh, fines under GDPR so far in some 1,043 cases. Litigation is up, and that's not just mega litigation. That's what you might call trivial litigation as well. People saying, you know, my... Uh, GP uh, um, electronically transmitted my prescription rather than printing it for me. Um, there are cookies on your website that I don't like. So a lot of this almost like have a go litigation. In the UK, we, we, we often call it slips and trips because it's people who have trivial personal injury cases and they now have trivial data breach cases instead. There's increasing concern, I think, over shareholders particularly if you're involved in some transaction, the business is worth less if, uh, if you have issues like this. You know, we've had a big case involving uh, Marriott's takeover of Starwood, for example, in the uh, UK where the acquirer was fined for the sins of the acquired. And I think the private equity community particularly looks at value more. More concerns from employees. People don't want to work for organizations that they think are leaky. And then I guess the, the sixth uh, is, is um, maybe a little unusual in that uh, insurance. I think a lot of people traditionally, a lot of CCOs have said, there is this risk that I can manage and there is this risk that I can insure. But the insurance market is very volatile at the moment. A lot of players went into the market offering low cost premiums, but when the tide has turned, they've not backed that promise. So a lot of people are really struggling to insure this risk. Then the final thing I'd say is don't underestimate the emotional aspect. For many of the compliance officers we work with, a data breach is the most horrible thing they have ever had to deal with at work. You might well, if it's a GDPR-related breach, because you've only got 72 hours, that might involve you being locked in a small room for 24 hours with people you don't really like. It's almost like a reality show but with consequences. So preparation, education, the things that Dudley's already mentioned become key because that's what a compliance officer can do to reduce all of those bad things happening. Yeah. Ben, you had some thoughts on this around the regulator attention that comes from this, didn't you? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, cybersecurity incidents and poor compliance is likely to lead to increased scrutiny from regulators. And, um, you know, most companies would like to be in a position where they, they regulate themselves, they manage their own risks. And you know, the more cybersecurity incidents you have, um, the more likely it is that, that regulators will come along and, and you know, uh, effectively do your, do your, well, not do, yeah, they will do your job for you. There will be more regulation. So, um, yeah, that is the, the first um, major uh, you know, that is the first major reason why, why compliance professionals should care about um, cybersecurity incidents. From a, this is coming at it from a legal point of view. 
And the um, another major legal risk, well, as Jonathan has mentioned, uh, is is well, I, I, is litigation uh, and particularly big class actions. In the US, we're seeing a lot of activity in in data breach class actions. These are actions where a, a litigation funder funds a a very wide class of individuals who've been subject to a data breach and tries to get compensation for them. On an individual basis, it'd be too expensive or it, those individuals are either uh, unable to afford or unwilling to take legal action by themselves. But with the help of the litigation funder, um, you know, a, taking a, a major action is feasible. And where there is a data breach, um, you know, that will, a, a litigation funder will fund these actions and it can result in a in a damages claim for hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. Um, we're seeing these actions against Google, Facebook, Zoom. Zoom recently settled one for about 80, 80 million US dollars, and that was um, you know that was a, a fairly small data breach. So, um, and and yeah, you know, this is an area that may develop in the UK and Australia where um, you know we've got there's a there's a case that's just gone before the. Supreme Court in the UK. Um, we're waiting to see what the, the feedback from that is, but um, it's possible. Um, it's possible we could get these US style data breach cases in either the UK or Australia. Mm. And that's a that's a financial risk that can't be insured, as Jonathan's pointed out, and isn't budgeted for. Correct. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's something to to your mitigation point that that the panel the comments were comments were coming earlier about you know some of the only ways to mitigate this risk are the kinds of things you have built into your compliance framework as well isn't it um so you know I, i'm interested in hearing what are the current cyber so cyber is a big bucket but what are the current cyber security issues affecting businesses and what are those impacts um ben i'll, I'll throw to you again for this one and then charmaine i'd like to hear from you if that's okay yeah, so um, I, I would break this down into two main categories. The, the first major risk is from ransomware hackers. Uh, these are groups of organised criminals that use ransomware to paralyse a company's software and they hold them to ransom. Uh, the, the, the impact of this is, like, is that there will be increased scrutiny from regulators and poten potentially more regulation, which is generally not something a, a company would want. Um, and again, it, it gives rise to a, a risk of class actions. Uh, the second major risk comes from state-sponsored cyber attacks. Uh, intelligence agencies around the world, and particularly more powerful countries, have uh, these intelligence agencies have developed a cyber warfare capability. And they do this because with rising geopolitical tensions, one state can use this as leverage over another to, to get what it wants. And we are likely to see more of these incidents as, as geopolitical tensions rise. Um, it's, it's harder for companies to guard, or, guard against that particular risk because these attacks are very sophisticated, uh, but companies in, in infrastructure, critical industries like gas and electricity supply need to take special precautions to to guard against those attacks. Domain, is, is, you know, what are you seeing as well? Similar, similar kinds of themes? Yeah, um, as Ben mentioned earlier, so ransomware is one of the top malicious threat of the year, but this is also followed by COVID-19 scams. And then you see a lot of attack on remote work tools, third-party compromise, supply chain attacks, amongst other data breaches, sometimes caused by insider threats as well, and BEC, which is yeah, business email compromise. So these are definitely not new, but you see them happen over different periods. Um, and over a period of time, they've been highlighted very extravagantly, depending on your know, political season or maybe as a result of different economical drivers as well. So um, as Ben mentioned, you know, they can be caused by nation state sponsors but or criminal gangs, but we also need to be mindful that there 
could this could happen because of disgruntled insiders or individual hackers or corporate spies you know so at the end of the day if you are a business owner you know all the more reason for you to be really careful especially if your company starts growing in reputation and size then it becomes more attractive for hackers to prey on your employees and your weakest links to try and take you down i just say one Oh, sorry, Jonathan, go. Yeah. I was just going to say one thing to sort of amplify that. What I've seen since September, October time is a material change in the attitude of regulators, building on both what what Shimon and and Ben uh, have said. Uh, And I think that they're acquiring specialists from other government agencies, particularly in the nation state, but uh, Mm. uh, uh, particularly with ransomware. So... Um, let's say I reported a, a, a breach under GDPR in August. You know, I'd, I'd report it. I probably wouldn't get asked questions and I'd get some sort of a regulatory finding. I've noticed since September, October last year, you get a more detailed questionnaire. There's clearly somebody who knows about ransomware, knows about these threats. Uh, uh, we picked up a piece of work yesterday uh, from another law firm where they'd said, oh, yeah, yeah, um, we reported a data breach last year. It's really easy. Do this. And they have been invited for interview uh, this morning by the regulator. And a lot of people, I think, because they had data breaches maybe early, earlier on, think that the regulator is not going to ask them questions. In this particular case, the, the guy who's leading it from the client is one of the help desk guys. And the CIO said, oh, he's a bright lad. He'll get through it. No, the regulator will want to see the CIO. They'll want to see the head of compliance. And they'll want to know that they are on the game. So there's been a real uh, need in the last year or so for everybody to take da- data breaches more seriously than they did partly because of who's behind a lot of these attacks and partly i think because regulators are getting better resourced and more skillful at responding to them hmm. can i yeah. i mean can i add yes. to that from an we're seeing exactly the same thing from an australian perspective um so that naomi and i and i we um were running a session last week with um, australia's privacy commissioner and there was a almost a feeling of frustration that was coming through from from the regulator in relation to um, how organisations in Australia were managing some data breaches. So um, I think the patience in some ways has run out. Mm. So up until now, there's been very much a focus on education. This is what you need to do. Um, you haven't quite done it here, but please do better next time. To, to you know, that sort of conversation is now moving to an enforcement piece. They're, they're, they're better funded. There's real talk of... Um, greater levels of enforcement, and we haven't necessarily seen the levels of enforcement um, that 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 you guys are used to in the UK or throughout Europe or, or or the US. But I think there's that appetite now because we've been several years into the mandatory data breach um, law requirements, and there's you know the, the regulators have taken the view well. Australian organisations, you've had more than enough time to understand what your obligations are. Um, And there was a real frustration, I think, Naomi, with particularly the financial services sector that um, were very lax, well, not lax, but, you know, 61% of of the breaches notified were out of time. And and in Australia, we've got a whole lot more time than you guys have in the the UK or Europe. With your 72-hour turnaround, we've got up to 30 days to notify um, a breach. So more than enough time to do that initial investigation and form a view about whether it constitutes serious harm and make the the relevant notification. so there's a real frustration. We're somewhat behind in terms of the the enforcement piece, but I see that that conversation is really changing now um, in this jurisdiction. And um, I suspect definitely we'll not be following buying you. that naivety, are they, Dudley? They're, they're expecting organisations to have put an expert in place who can give them serious advice and not oh. just work on a sort of best intentions kind of framework. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Naomi. Yeah. Yeah. So look, we get we come to the goals, you know, what does best practice look like when it comes to mitigating risk? And you guys touched on training, and that's a cornerstone of trying to mitigate a whole lot of 
compliance controls, isn't it? But Charmaine, what do you think from a technology example, perhaps? Um, I would say maybe not just technology because at the end of the day, it involves people, process and technology, right? So I would say my top three tips then would be, you know, um, as a few of them mentioned earlier about um, security culture, right? So that's very, very important. You need to make sure that you have the right cyber hygiene across all different levels of your employees as well. So we are always as strong as our weakest links. So humans are often our weakest links. So we can, you know, sometimes we call them the insider threat, but really they can also be our strongest first line of defense if we focus on building a really healthy security culture. So in terms of mitigating risk, that will be one of my key emphasis. But if I were to look at the other two, then I would say, you know, it's very important to have a robust BCP plan, you know, you have to practice and rehearse that consistently. So, um, and actually the book that I just released, there is a, I featured this story by Yuval Ilus, who is the group CISO at Standard Chartered Bank. And he shared that, you know, in addition to the crisis management simulations that you see a lot of the CISOs run, um, he implemented something called the near miss exercises, which I thought was really good because they based this on their current incidents um, that they observe that's happening, whether it's in the US, in the UK, you know, in Australia. And even though they might not be impacted by it, they actually mimic uh, what's, what's, how's their response going to be like if um, the attack has you know, did actually hit them. And through this sort of exercises, it really significantly helped them identify areas of improvement um, and it helped them to be better prepared for the next attack. And then lastly, I would say, you know, how well do you really know your business, right? So we talk, we talk about like four types of risk mitigating strategies and that include risk avoidance, acceptance, uh, transference and limitation. But at the end of the day, it's very important to understand the mission of your business and the value of the business so effective execution would require a really good understanding of what and how the business perceives risk and then you are able to influence them to achieve a meaningful outcome so it involves knowing also how to overcome best practice apathy which does exist a lot in companies so these are the three keys i would say brilliant jonathan what are your yeah, thoughts on I, I i agree with a lot of that i think in gdpr terms we're often concentrating on technical and organizational measures. So a breach isn't a breach if you've got technical or organizational measures that prevent it happening. But I think businesses should turn that around and concentrate on technical and organizational. So you're looking for belt and braces all of the time, that, you know, two lines of defense, if you like. So to give you an example, we did, uh, we got invited by a client in the US to go over. They said, look, We've had all sorts of audits. Um, we're, we're clean. We want somebody to look specifically with a GDPR focus. Um, so with a, with a particularly childish nature, uh, and because I'm slightly techy, I managed to disable their access control system so I could walk through the doors of their building. But as soon as I did, the receptionist, it turns out, has a button under her desk, which she pressed, and the hugest guys you've seen in your life appeared. And, you know, basically I was in, in peril as a result because nobody had told them a dumb lawyer was going to try and break into the building. So, um, so, so why was that great? Well, the technical measures failed, but the organizational measures, sharp-witted secretary, two large guys, uh, prevented there being a, a, a breach. So you're exactly right that you've got to simulate breaches, work out what your defenses are, try and look at technical and organizational measures. If you can have two technical and two organizational, that's absolutely great. And how do you do that in practice? Well, um, in, the, in, in the GDPR world and pre-GDPR in the UK, we've had a, a privacy impact assessment. So a process to go through whatever you're doing, what the impact might be, what are the risks, how you're going to mitigate them. I know in Australia, I think your regulators looked at the same model for 10 years or more. Um, under GDPR, they, they assume a sort of statutory status. And I, I, I'll be really honest, I made protestations against that. I didn't think that was a regulator's role uh, uh, to look at DPIAs in the way that they were proposed to work in the EU. 
But I'm happy to say they, they became more flexible and they're a great way of reducing risk because you've got to look at that disciplined approach of, you know, what are the threats here? Who are the threat actors? How can I mitigate that risk? And as, uh, and, and as Shemaine has said, how can I either reduce it or avoid it completely? And you need a disciplined approach to all of that. And, and, and you need to take time over it as well. Uh, we always say internally, if we're doing a DPIA for a client, you're not allowed to send it out the day that you've drafted it because you need to stew on it a couple of days. I guarantee you, you will think of other risks at three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning that aren't in the DPIA first cut round. So keep looking at those risks. Put yourself in the minds of an attacker and then your prevention will follow. Ben, I throw to you, we talked about that mitigating and a lot of the stuff that came up from uh, the participants was consult an expert. And from what you've just said, Jonathan, like my mind goes to, well, I don't know who's going to want to attack me and I don't know what they're going to want to get or why they why they would even want to do it. So, so, Ben, what's your perspective on mitigating risks as well? Because you have to get experts. How do you know what you don't know? Yeah, um, I, I mean, the major, the major legal risk would be increased scrutiny from regulators um, and well, potentially fines and further regulation. Um, you know, I, I guess it is a question of being well organised in the first place, having a, a robust, um, a, I, I mean, I'd come at this from a legal point of view, um, you'd, you'd want to have a, a robust um, strategy to cover off on your, on your legal risks. Um, that, you know, that probably translates to um, have, you know, it basically translates to having a robust uh, cyber cyber security defence strategy. And Dudley, quick question to you, because you also talked about training and mitigating with training, because, again, the actors are unknown and your average staff member is probably naively trotting, trotting through the world thinking everything's fine. How do you train for that? Um. With, with difficulty, but but I think, um, you know, if I can perhaps just pick up, up a little bit on what Ben was saying just there, uh, if you've got, and, and Shemaine mentioned this also, and as has Jonathan, the, the importance of having uh, um, an incident response plan in place that you actually test on a regular basis. And what we're seeing sort of in more recent times is that these incident re response plans are not just sitting on the top of filing cabinets, gathering dust. They're, they're actually being um, amended, they're being reviewed, they're being worked over, they're being um, updated. And we're seeing the introduction of um, playbooks. Um, and I think Shemaine gave a good example of all of the various risks from a cyber perspective that you need to try and keep on top of. And um, going to your question, Naomi, it's very difficult to keep on top of those risks. So having a playbook that will um, set out how you expect the organisation to deal with ransomware attacks or phishing attacks or business email compromise, all of the various different flavours of, of risk that are starting to sort of um, affect organisations. And um, I, I think it's too, in some ways too hard a task for you to expect your employees to be on top of all that. Um, but as an organisation, you definitely should be on top of all that and, um, and, and understand that 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 risk is evolving and that's why um, you, you are needing to regularly review your incident response plans. It's why you're developing particular playbooks to, um, to address increasing risk. And Jonathan mentioned the, the rise and rise of ransomware and having a strategy, what, you know, what do we do as an organisation when a ransomware attack hits? Um, the, the question to pay or not to pay, um, can we rely on our insurance? What, are, what about our insurers? Um, there's a, um, a number of insurers that are actually making ransomware payments, um, preventing ransomware payments from being made or excluding ransomware from, from their policies altogether. So I think it's an impossibility for employees and organisations to keep ahead of the curve in some ways. And, and, but what they can do is, is to, to understand that the risk is evolving and to continually to to update and test their incident response plans and develop playbooks to, to mitigate and reduce risk as, as well as they can. Yeah, and look, and, and that's, a, that's a really nice segue because ransomware's come up again and again and you and I have had this discussion about whether or not you pay the ransom. Um, you're sitting in the don't pay camp, I'm thinking still, Dudley? 
I don't think it's as black and white as all that. And I know Jonathan's got some thoughts on this as well. It, it, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's not a black and white answer. It's not a yes or no answer. And what we would certainly advise clients and what we've seen in terms of how ransomware attacks are playing out is that you are running this sort of two horse race where you are madly working in the background to to restore your data in traditional from a traditional forensics perspective, but to the extent you need to engage with the the, the bad actor, you are also doing that again, obviously in, consistent with your playbook and your incident response plan. And and some organisations will choose not to deal with the bad actor at all. Some insurers will require that you you don't you don't do that. Whereas other organisations having um, enlisted the help of experts in the area are quite happy to happy and I use the term loosely but they are prepared to engage with that person uh, with that organization whilst at the same time trying to restore data from a, from a more traditional perspective um, so Naomi I don't think it's a black and white answer anymore unfortunately I wish there was uh, I wish it was because then you just go tick done that Jonathan what do you think yeah I mean I, I- I sort of agree. I think that there are maybe 5% of cases when you've got to consider uh, paying. I think there's a whole a raft of reasons not to. Um, mm. uh, the, um, I mean, the, the BBC, for example, have done a lot of work on looking at hackers. There's a podcast that I'd recommend called The Lazarus Heist, where some of these hackers are um, nation states as well. So North Korea, for example, you may be breaching sanctions rules if you're paying hackers, uh, ransomware gangs based in North Korea. You may be funding uh, all sorts of other nefarious things. If you are paying ransom, I think if you're a listed entity, you're going to have to be transparent. You're going to have to disclose that. There's a criminal case against uh, Uber's former CEO in the US where he used a pre-allocated bug bounty budget pre-allocated by the board to pay off uh, ransomware. And there's all sorts of, uh, you know, this will be a case worth watching when, Married at First Sight has finished its uh, next season in Australia because um, there are going to be all sorts of mud thrown between the former management of Uber, the current management and the CEO uh, somewhat in the middle. Um, And also, of course, we know that um, law enforcement in Australia, in the UK and in the US are putting much more effort into looking at who is paying ransom, how they're paying it, whether they're doing it through cryptocurrency. A lot, uh, uh, and, and the fundamental thing is you're dealing with criminals. And, and guess what? Some criminals are not honest. So they don't honor their promises. And some of them pretend that they uh, are putting ransomware on, on your system when they're not. They, they're a sort of, there's almost like a, um, a sort of a, a grade league of ransomware with the very good people at the top, uh, but then progressively down to chances who are acquiring old software for which encryption keys are already commonly available and telling you that you've got ransomware. We've also seen a real move from hitting blue chip corporations to hitting you know, middling and and, and smaller organizations as well. So you've got to know who you're dealing with. I agree with one on our thought cloud originally. This isn't a job for the enthusiastic amateur. And and I know this sort of self-interested to say it, but you don't need somebody who's dealing with their first ransomware attack. You need an experienced team that'll tell you who you need to move quickly. And one last uh, illustration of that we had a client, a major uh, organization, hit by ransomware. We refused to pay the ransom. As is common, the gang posted, uh, in this case, only 11 passports that they'd taken from the system to prove that they were serious. Um, we were able to manage that. We locate, you know, we knew the 11 people. We, we sort of wrapped them round with love and we made sure that they were looked after. But within mm. 24 hours, a site had appeared from a law firm claiming to act on behalf of employees in bringing litigation. So to Ben's point, a lot of the litigation lawyers are very quick out of the traps now. And if we hadn't have got in 
and manage those 11 individuals, then I think it would have escalated very quickly. So oftentimes now, because you've got these 72 hour deadlines, but you've also got ransomware gangs on your tail as well, you're having to set up multiple teams to deal with different aspects of the attack. So to Dudley's point, uh, rehearsal is key. You've got to make sure that everybody knows their role. You've got to have that muscle memory, really, of knowing what everybody's doing when the alarm bell rings. Charmaine, is that something that you think about in your, you know, rehearsal responses and incident responses? Yeah, definitely. Because when when the ransom hits you, you don't really have time to respond. You don't have time to think. And the best way for you to be really strategic in your communication, whether it's internally or externally, it's when before any attack happens, because that's when you have the time and the space. And I've always said, like, uh, even in one of the talks I gave about, you know, the cyber game of chess, right? If you're playing a chess game, you don't have time to to. A lot of times when a ransom hit, uh, ransomware hits you, right, you are dragged into the game unwillingly. You are, un- you know, unwilling participant, and then you're forced to play the whole game. But if you want to be able to, you know, say checkmate, that's when you want to take control of the game. You know, best to start planning beforehand, you know, be strategic about it. Um, and I also wanted to just make a comment that um, I've seen a shift as well. In the past, you know, it's, it's very new. So a lot of companies don't really know how to deal with this. Um, but we are seeing that as more people are talking about it, the awareness has, has gone up a lot. And there's a case in point, like um, a company was hit with um, ransomware and they actually talked to Interpol about it and turns out that Interpol already knew about like all the um, uh, the software to actually help them unlock their systems and they didn't need to actually make the payment if they had not raised it up and most of the time you know companies want to keep it under wraps first and try to resolve it um, because of the fear of you know how is it going to look on them in reputation and, and stuff like that? But um, sometimes it's about really involving um, the ecosystem as well. And, and the solution is, uh, could have already been out there and you can you know, help you get out of it faster. So there's, there's, there is that shift in progress and, and maturity in how um, businesses are learning how to deal with it. But it's still, yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> And can, I, can I just to, add, oh, sorry, sorry, I, I, sorry, I've jumped ahead of you, Naomi. I just want, I, I like the point that Shemaine's mentioned there, particularly around the transparency piece. Um, and there's a lot more willingness for organisations that have been impacted to, to have an open and upfront conversation with their customers, with their employees, with their stakeholders, and probably most importantly, I think, and Ben will attest to this, is with their regulators. And that's said something that perhaps we didn't see in the early days of these events when they they happen people were very quick to try and sweep it under the carpet deal with it themselves they weren't wanting it to become public knowledge but now there's almost a good citizen a good citizen type approach where where organizations will understand that other you know the other organizations have been impacted that um, they can call on um, that ecosystem that Shemaine is talking about to help, you know, um, deal with the incident that's affecting them currently. And re- regulators, when you, you you try and sweep things under the carpet, oh my goodness, you do save yourself up a lot of um, heartache and problems down the track. And um, it's those organisations that sort of understand that we have to be transparent, we have to have a good comms plan around this, we have to say what we're going to do and actually do it. Um, the, those are the ones that seem to, to recover quickly. Uh, the, the, the less sophisticated organisations that are still hell-bent on sweeping things under the carpet or, or not enlisting um, help from experts at an early stage, they're the ones that struggle and they're the ones that take a very long time to respond to and then to probably, more importantly, to recover from um, the incident once it's occurred. Sorry, yes. I, I cut across you before you had a question. No, 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 but that, that leads me nicely. Yes, I was, I, was, I was just going to ask Ben a similar question. It's, it's, you need to have those conversations with regulators. There's a different relationship, isn't it, when you're in that situation and you need to let go of that idea that you somehow caused this or it, it's the more mature organisations that are facing the reality that this is a threat and you need to be a grown-up and go and have a conversation with your regulator. Yes. Um, you know, and it's it, it's not an easy conversation either, particularly in the EU. Um, 
you know, the the big tech companies are having very, very difficult conversations um, with the regulator. And, you know, there is likely to be further regulation of those tech companies. Um, you know, there is a, there's something like 80 different investigations going on into the, the major tech companies on their, their data practices. Um, so, um, you know, we're going to see, you know, there is going to be a lot more regulation, um, you know, particularly of, of uh, big data, if you like, or, or major tech companies you know, in the EU. And one and of I the things, this... sorry, I, I was that? just going to say one of one of the tips I could give people is um, we did a piece of work uh, about the first year of GDPR, where we looked at data breach cases, and we looked at what regulators across the EU were asking people to do. Uh, or ordering them to do. So commonly, we're seeing cases, Italy, for example, led the way with uh, a, a case against um, Telecom Italia Mobile, where they fine 20 million euros and say, and you shall do the following seven things within X months. So we took uh, what were those things that they were ordering things to uh, people to do and put them in a big database. So whenever we react with uh, uh, regulators, you work out what the regulator is going to order you to do and then volunteer to do it. And we found that a, a, a really good strategy with regulators, where if you can be self-aware, you're being transparent and you're also saying, this is what we've learned already. And if you can do that within 24 hours, 48 hours, the conversation with regulators is materially different. And for a lot of organizations, you can do something in 24 hours. You know, we've talked a lot about electronic data breaches. People are still losing suitcases full of data. If you can make sure, in, as we did in one case, that everyone's briefcase has a lock on it within 24 hours, regulator will give you credit for that. If you can train that team in 48 hours, not to leave briefcases full of stuff on trains, planes, and automobiles. Regulators will give you credit for that. So you can manage that conversation with regulators if you're self-aware and if you're willing to react quickly and put in place measures that they're going to order you to do eventually anyway. Mm. And look, I, I think... Uh, you know, I was just about to ask everyone for their top tips. So that's a great one, Jonathan. I think, uh, Charmaine, that goes to your earlier point, have a plan and be really rehearsed with that plan. What, what What's another tip that you'd leave people with? Because I think the, the times of everyone going, oh, we've got a firewall for that, they're long gone. We know it's going to happen. So what do you do? Um, I would say like if you have your basics covered already, then it's time to level up as well. Um, earlier to your point about, you know, we don't know what we don't know, right? So a lot of companies I've seen, they've started looking at like getting rate teams to come in and do simulations for them. So when you talk about rate teams, they are actually a team of ethical hackers. So they are the good guys, but they are there to pretend to hack your organization and see if they can, you know, think about it like James Bond, but without the guns uh, or the cars. And they are trying to penetrate into your company through various means whether is it through a breach in your technology or your people or your process and they'll find you know all the vulnerabilities and look at exploiting that so that is a really good exercise because at the end of it you know um, they come to you with all the findings of all the things that you do not know um, but it's presented to you about what are the things you should be fixing and remediating so having a rate team to come in to do that can be really really helpful um, but of course if your organization is not mature yet you know the basics are not done there's not even any cyber hygiene then you know you wouldn't want to engage them because they can cost quite a bit um, it's like getting an army tank to come in and <laughs> rob your lunch box so yeah so I would suggest yeah make sure you start with the basics and then make sure you have a plan and as well um, over you know a couple of years uh, a cyber resilience program um, where you're always increasing your maturity at each stage. Mm -hmm. Dudley what, what's your top tip? Oh, look I agree with um, Shemaine there I, I think um, if, if there was one top tip it would be um, be prepared um, have a, an instant response plan in place test that um, plan regularly um, look to introduce playbooks um, that are consistent with 
um, how your organization wants to deal with with that risk and and see this as a journey this isn't just a, a one-off where you you trot off to your your lawyer your consultant have them draft something up and then it as I said before sits on top of a filing cabinet somewhere this is a a living document it's a living policy it's um it's an evolving policy and it's part of your journey to move from um or move towards a, a position where you are prepared to to manage and deal with a uh, an incident when it occurs and i think if if there's one message is that i want to leave with people is that it's not a question of of if it's a question of when so if you have that mindset then you're the next steps beyond that are, are in some ways fairly easy and straightforward because you know there's a risk that that you can work towards reducing and mitigating so that that would be my top tip or, or series of tips brilliant and ben a top tip from you it might be the same as everyone else's top tip yeah i i you know it's 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 broadly the it's broadly the same um you know really um you want you want to have a <clears throat> You want to be self-regulating. You don't want to be in a position where regulators are coming along <clears throat> and telling you what to do. Um, if you have rob robust cyber security defences in the first place, um, you know you want to be in the position to self-regulate, not have regulators do it for you. That would be and and look to Dudley's point earlier. I think in Australia, the the reflections and the comments <laughs> from regulators are implying that they're not seeing the level of maturity they're expecting in their testy tones when. <laughs> When they, when they come to speak at our conference, like, oh, okay, well, we'll do better. Um, but, but thank you, panel, for that. We've got a couple of questions that have popped up in the mm -hmm. chat. So add questions quickly if you've got any because we've got uh, six minutes left. But a, a quick one that I think must be coming from a non-EU base, so I might flick it to you, Dudley or Charmaine. Is it true that GDPR may still apply to you if your company handles data of a European citizen whose data has been collected at a time when he, she were in Europe, do other regions have similar provisions too? It's a very complex question. To be honest, I'm, I'm not all things GDPR, so I would probably throw to a Jonathan on that to comment. Yeah, the, the, the first bit, I think, is a GDPR question. And the, the simple answer is yes. Uh, we can go through more detail of the extraterritoriality provisions, but let's say it's an Australian business. Let's say it's selling online or monitoring the behavior using cookies, for example, on its website of EU citizens, then it does uh, have to comply with GDPR. And it can be worse than a domestic business because it's going to have to find somebody called a data protection representative. And you can be fined for not having the DPR. And, and we've had a, a, a Dutch case uh, in the last 12 months that's had a, had a significant fine for that. And as a general rule, and, and maybe Dudley and, and, and Shimei might speak on this, as a general rule, most regulators are also trying to mirror that extraterritoriality. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. most regulators, it's the same as banking, for example, that regulators are no longer content with regulating people whose shingle is on their shores. They want to regulate anybody who's playing in their market. And that's definitely a trend that we're going to see with privacy and security legislation going forward. Definitely. Which segues yeah. nicely to the next question. If I have an international data breach, which regulator do I contact first? And how do I decide whose process takes priority? What happens if they contradict? I don't think you're going to get so much contradiction these days. We, I mean, we saw that with the page up breach where they were caught between a rock and a hard place as a requirement to notify under... Uh, in the UK, but also um, needing to notify in Australia. And because they were under a, a shorter time frame in the UK with a 72-hour requirement, they they made that that notification in compliance with the requirements there. But but having notified one regulator, it obviously wasn't open to them to sit on that um, for any period of time. So they jointly did, uh, did a notification in Australia as well, notwithstanding that they had 30 days up their sleeve. So again, you, you wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy, but you know the, the the feedback on how that particular company managed that that dual um, notification obligation or that that competing regulatory um, <clears throat> requirements was actually very good. And and again, it goes to their transparency, their good comms. Um, and the, willing to have the hard conversations very early on in the piece, um, both 
with regulators, but probably more importantly with their customers, uh, which that they did very effectively. I think you should always assume that regulators and your customers are empl- and employees are talking with each other. You know, I, I can remember back in the day, very early on, one of the biggest breaches I handled pre GDPR, there was a reporting obligation to US employees. The company uh, didn't want to report to uh, EU employees that they'd lost their payroll details. And we were trying to say to them, it's going to be about 30 minutes before somebody in the US rings a colleague in Europe and say, what do you think about the fact that our payroll details have gone missing? The company was adamant that they weren't going to tell the European employees. And I think, yeah, I think we tracked it at 27 minutes <laughs> before <laughs> the knowledge. And, and, and in wow. this world, customers are going to talk to each other. They're going to talk online. Employees are going to do that. And guess what? Regulators do as well. And there are formal networks like um, GPEN, for example, where they talk to each other on issues. And there are informal uh, things as well, you know, even to the extent, I don't know, UK regulators done internal staff briefings for regulator in Ireland. So there's lots of cooperation. You have to assume that every other regulator is going to find out quickly. Mm. And as Dudley says, you've got to have a plan for that. And language can be a barrier factor in time because a French regulator wants to be told in French. They don't want to be told in English. Mm. And and so Mm. you've got to build in that time into your notification plan as well. That's a really interesting point, Jonathan. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. And, and I think that that's, you know, we're, we're playing in a space where uh, your customers have a trust relationship with you and they don't seem to mind if you charge them a few fees extra on the account and they understand that you're running a business. But when it's with their data and their privacy, don't mess with that trust quotient because mm. that's, that's not negotiable for them because that's their intangible asset, I guess, that they that they value. We have one final question, uh, which was around if anyone had any real life um, experience with ransomware, and I can gamely put up my hand as, yes, we did. I was the person who opened the email and went, oh, goody, Australia Post is delivering something to me and launched an attack. So um, we paid and didn't get anything back. (laughs) (laughs) But but I'll, I'll throw very quickly to the panelists before we wrap up. What are your experiences? If you pay, what what's the percentage that you're likely to actually get your data back? I, I'll, I'll almost answer it with another question oh. to say. Uh, so, sorry to interrupt. Shivan, you go oh. first. Go. Um, even if you pay and you get the keys, that doesn't mean to say you get your data back. You know, mm. uh, the Irish Health Service has had one of the biggest ransomware attacks. Uh, there are figures, I think... I'm happy to send anyone the figures who who wants them. But I think they brought in from memory, I think about another two and a half thousand IT advisors, mostly from the Irish military. They were given the keys. Um, They've still only got about 80% of the devices back three months later. So even paying the ransom isn't the silver bullet. You don't get everything back, even if the gang play ball with you. So... Um, you've always got to factor that cost into the uh, equation. And um, from my experience, as I say, it isn't as simple as paying. Uh, Charmaine? Charmaine? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say there's different code of conduct as well, you know, between the different uh, ransom uh, criminals, gangs. (laughs) Code of conduct, (laughs) I love it, sorry. (laughs) Yeah, there are some who, you know, will not attack um, companies if it's going to result in a loss of life and things like that. And some of them, they apparently honor it where we have seen like you know they have there are many cases where they have actually given um the keys back right with a promise that they are not going to attack the same company again or help other criminals attack them but then there's also cases where um yeah there's just a lot of but because there's so many ver- you know varieties of criminals out there you don't really know who you're dealing with so to jonathan's point like at the end of the day you know you <laughs> You uh, it's a huge risk that you're taking. Um, so you need to look at other risk transfer options, you know. And at the same time, um, yeah, I just wanted to. You have to be mindful about who you're dealing with, and you don't really know. There are also companies who have a lot, lots of guts, where they, they, I've seen actually exact um conversations that happen between them, me, and they're negotiating with the um the criminals, right? And they did, they refuse to take the bait, and they were 
like be saying names and throwing back names at the gang and saying, I don't care what you do with my data. I don't even bother. And, and the <laughs> criminal got really upset because they were getting nowhere with them in a negotiation. So there's, um, it's, but it takes a lot of guts because if they go ahead with their threats, the company is going to look really bad and, and you know, reputation damage. Um, there's a lot of recovery work that you might not even recover from it. I've seen businesses gone bankrupt. So there's, man, it's a whole spectrum. Um, and I would say don't take the risk. Make sure your, your company is as mature as possible and as resilient as possible so you can deal with any attacks in the future. Um, but that will be the, yeah. Last thing I want to highlight. Look, that that's that's a fabulous closing remark because there's so many pieces and cogs in this puzzle, aren't there? You know, the the things they can do with the data. It's not just denial of your your files and what you want to do with them. It's what they can do with it out there. So it's a whole world of pain, um, and you need to be prepared. So I'd like to uh, thank our panelists. I'd like to thank Lexus Nexus and Cams. Um, and all the attendees for joining us today. Uh, it's been a great session. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience in this area. Thank you, Thank you for Thanks, having us.